All right, so this is our first video for the class, at least from what I'm creating. And uh, you've already read the chapter in the book. So this is just to reiterate a few key things um, and add some things that are not in the textbook. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, looking at the definition of fraud. Uh, according to Black's Law Dictionary, they define it as any misrepresentation of the truth or concealment of a fact to induce another to act. So basically, there has to be some type of lie. And this could be verbal, although most of the time there is um, a more written lie. And this could be a fake document. So if I intentionally put my address on an invoice to be paid, that is the misrepresentation of truth. So it has to be big enough. It has to be something that somebody would act upon. So if I had a standard looking invoice, once again, with my address on expecting a check, that is material enough. And if I had all the appropriate documentation, albeit fake, an accounts payable clerk would probably go ahead and pay that. The other thing that's not a part of this, that's not, or that is a part of it that's not actually in the law dictionary definition is you have to be able to show intent. Meaning, if I were to take somebody to court uh, for criminal charges for fraud, you have to prove that it wasn't an accident. I just didn't accidentally type my address on that invoice. Now, most fraudsters repeat crimes over and over. So therefore, it is pretty easy to show intent. You can't accidentally create 10 documents with the wrong address mistakenly. So intent does have to be shown, but in many cases, that is not difficult, as I said, because of the repetitive nature of many frauds. Most don't stop at the one-time fraud. So we're going to break down, there's a lot of different frauds, and we're really only going to focus on one type of fraud in this class, uh, but I want to mention what some of the other ones were. So there's external fraud, meaning external to the company. So it's a fraud against a company by a non-employee. So some a vendor, um, a customer, or a non-related hacker, if you want to go into computer fraud. So some examples of this are bid rigging. So having uh, vendors collude with each other to basically take turns to who gets what bids if you're bidding for the same project. Um, if I'm a vendor, I mistakenly bill you incorrectly over and over, writing bad checks, um, doctors creating uh, for insurance fraud or healthcare fraud or some of the examples. We're not going to cover those in class. We're going to focus on internal fraud, which we'll get to in just a second. The other is individual fraud. This is stealing from unsuspecting victims. And you hear about this every once in a while on the news. Um, it happened down at, at in Cedar Rapids after the derecho, a fake tree service company was uh, putting in bids and asking for money up in advance, and then they never did the work. So these are against victims, individuals. Ponzi schemes, you've heard of several Ponzi schemes in the news in the last three, four years. Phishing schemes and other things like this. Once again, we're not going to cover these in the course, although they are interesting topics. What we are going to focus on in the course is occupational fraud. Some textbooks will call this internal fraud. This is basically using the occupation of one's occupation for your personal enrichment. So you're committing fraud against the company you work for. This could be misuse of resources or the misapplication of the resources or assets. And that is the definition by the American, Certifi uh, American Certified Fraud Examiners, the Association of American Fraud Examiners. There we go. So we're really going to focus on that. There's really three types of external fraud. Um, first of all, there's a misappropriation of assets. And we're going to talk about this for the majority of the class. 
financial statement fraud, and corruption. So misappropriation of assets is kind of what it sounds, stealing of assets. So um, most of the frauds that we're going to look at that are in your textbook are of this type. Financial statement fraud is basically falsifying your financial statements in order to mislead external parties, such as your stakeholders, the SEC, those who are buying your stock, potentially banks. And corruption is more of a bribery type of fraud where you are trying to pay to get some special treatment, etc. So we're really going to focus on the first one a little bit on the second one. So this diagram shows the fraud triangle. There's really three components of the fraud triangle, opportunity, pressure, and rationalization. And this is what we talked about if you had accounting information systems with me. We focused on the fraud triangle. So there's really, in the early research, it showed that there were three things that most fraudsters exhibited before committing a fraud. First of all, there at the top, they had opportunity. So they had some type of ability to be able to commit the fraud. In most cases, this is due to a lack of internal control or lack of good supervision or just find some way that the door opens that they can commit the fraud. Collusion also does create opportunity, and we'll talk about that when we get into controls just a little bit. Then there's pressure. There is some force that is making the fraudster want to commit fraud. Now, for some fraudsters, they found this is pretty easy. They need very little pressure in order to do this. But for most of us, it would be extreme dire circumstances that we would take advantage of an opportunity and take that risk. So things that add pressure. Financial pressure is probably the most common one. So there's some type of pressure. Gambling does cause pressure, but there are things that are outside a person's control. Large debt due to medical bills is probably one of the more common ones. And sometimes for us, the easiest to at least understand. Not condone, but understand. And the last one is rationalization. Most fraudsters had some ability of rationalization. However, that was not always the case as further research shows. So rationalization is basically how can the fraudsters sleep at night? It's how can they put away that guilty conscience? So it's when you hear language, well, I didn't get that raise. I deserved it type of thing. I didn't get that promotion. Everybody else is making more money. These are types of rationalizations that a lot of people would have in order to be able to commit the fraud. As I said, they have to find some way in their own mind to justify their actions. So one of the things that after the fraud triangle came out, they looked at was the accidental fraudster versus the more predator. So the accidental fraudster is normally a good person. They are trustworthy, they're well thought of, they're law abiding, and some unique pressure happens. So there is something that happens in their life that turns the switch and allows them to take that an opportunity for their own personal gain. As I said, financial pressure is a common one. And, and for most of us, this would be pretty dire circumstances. And there, then there's the predator. So this is somebody who basically comes to an organization and looks for the opportunity to commit fraud from the day one. Um, they're more deliberate. They're better focused. And they don't really need a lot of pressure. Maybe the pressure is part of the game for them. Uh, and they definitely rack, lack the ra rationalization that the accidental fraudsters have. I had the opportunity to hear and listen to one of these fraudsters at um, UNI, actually. They brought him in for a presentation. And basically, this individual said he 
he went to school to learn to be the best account he could because he was supposed to come back to the company and run that fraud. And he's basically from day one said he would do it again. And um, his only regret is he got, they got caught. And basically he turned evidence against his entire family and never spent a day in jail because of it. So he was more, he was definitely by far of all the people that I've ever listened to from a fraud standpoint was one of the most predator type attitudes. So this led to the fraud diamond. So you see, it's actually two triangles on top of each other with the white base there together. On the top is the accidental fraudster, the ones that are in dire. They're the ones who have basically the traditional fraud triangle. They have opportunity. They need the rationalization because they probably do have more of a conscience than the predator. And then the pressure. They need more pressure. On the bottom triangle, you see the predator. Once again, they need to have opportunity. Somehow their door has to be open for them to be able to commit fraud. And they do it because they can. But they also have more of, according to this research, um, a criminal mindset. And they also are arrogant. Um, and I'll be honest, the fraudster I talked to that fit into this category was extremely arrogant. You could, you could tell that from two minutes into the conversation. And he just had the criminal mindset. So as I said, he knew his job when he went to college was to become the best accountant to run the fraud scheme back at his company. So he'd had that mindset. It was part of his intention from day one. And I'm assuming none of you are going to college here to have that as part of your mindset. So it takes, it's a very unique person and that has some different psychology behind them that most of us can't understand, thankfully. All right, another view of this is Crow's Fraud, Fraud Pentagon. Um, and it really, this takes just a little bit different view, take of what was shown in the fraud diamond. But so I wanted to show just how some of these theories, but how they all work together. So <clears throat> we have the same opportunity, pressure and rationalization. But in this research, uh, they added arrogance. And I think they're still, even for the accidental fraudster, there is still a little bit of arrogance needed. Well, I, I can get away with this type of thing. Maybe not to the extreme, as I said, of other fraudsters that are more predator, but I still think there is a little bit for most people there. And there also is competence. And I agree with this one being added to the mix. Competent, you have to, understand the systems and understand the processes pretty well in order to be able to commit fraud. And more importantly, you need to know how to cover it up because if one time fraud and done, is not going to get you the financial benefit that most people are looking for if they get, go to the other side and start to commit fraud. Now in your textbook, Negrini took the fraud Pentagon. So the five things here, the original fraud triangle plus arrogance and competence and adds undeterred. So undeterred means that really, if you think that you're going to go to jail, you think the odds are so slim that you're not deterred by potential future penalties. So that is not enough to stop you. And as we look at a lot of these cases, you'll see evidence of all of these um, characteristics of fraudsters throughout them. Some may have more, some that are more prevalent than others, but I think you're going to see a mix. And that's going to be one of your first assignments is with the Ryan Loma case is to listen to a podcast with an interview and determine what characteristics of the fraud hexagon were present. All right, so the bulk of this uh, course, at least the last three weeks, it, we're going to really talk about audit data analytics. 
And more particular, we're going to look at fraud analytics. So if you look here at the definition of the audit data analytics from, uh, from the AICPA in the guide to audit data analytics, it is the science of art and discovering patterns, identifying anomalies, and extracting other useful information and data underlying or related to the subject matter of an audit through analytics, modeling, visualization, for the, and for the purpose of performing the audit. That's a lot to take in, but basically we're going to use some techniques to walk through the process to look at, you know, to learn techniques of how to identify these patterns and things that are different, the anomalies, and try to get that to what we're going to look at. Is there a fraud risk here? Do we think there's a potential fraud? We always say it's potential because without other evidence from just the analysis we're doing, it's still potential. So that is what we're going to look at. So forensic analytics, which is the title of your book, is different than your financial statement audits. We're looking for evidence of fraud, or where is there a higher risk of fraud? As I said, we always don't jump to the conclusion that there is a fraud, but we want to try to determine a risk or potential and then gather additional data. All right, so this is the end of our first module uh, kind of review. And um, from here, you'll progress going into the Ryan Loma podcast and with the rest of your assignments. Take care.